I grew up, uh, we grew up uh, going to the state fair and that continued in some years when we were, uh, were married. Uh, <clears throat> I've been to the state fair in a long time, but um, many, many years ago, probably 28 by now, I was uh, attending one of the state fairs. And at every state fair you go to a lot, the exposition hall or sometimes called the exposition center. It's kind of a multi-purpose facility, but this particular exposition hall had rows and rows of booths that were occupied by either organizations or by companies that were supplying information about their, uh, their product or, or what they did as, as an organization. So one hot summer afternoon, I'm walking through the booths and most of the booths, I could care less, you know, what they were selling. I, I didn't want the next best kitchen knife no desire for that. I had no desire for a soft water system. I didn't want to purchase the Encyclopedia Britannica at that time. This is when they actually sold that big, huge copies. So, you know, you glance and then you move on. Except when I came to this one booth. And that booth grabbed my attention. On the display table was a booklet, and I still have it today. It's like 28, maybe more years old. Uh, that I, I pulled this thing off the table. And what, what attracted me was the cover of this because it begins by saying, when it happens, it will change the world for good. And so I was curious and I began to open it up and it began with these words. What will happen will make a world of difference. And when it happens... It will change your life, my life, our life, the world's life. It will give a new life to life. Well, by now, you know, I'm tracking right along with this and very curious as to what it is saying. Well, it goes on. What is about to happen has been spoken about for over 3,300 years. It's been written about for over 3,300 years. And has been waited for by millions of people for over 3,300 years. Or at this point, it's certainly got my attention and my curiosity. And then it answers the question, what is this about? And it states, what is about to happen is Mashiach. Mashiach is coming here and now. And he will not only make a world of difference, he will make a different world. Of course, having studied a little bit before I got there, you know, over the course of years, I knew that Mashiach was the Hebrew word for, for Messiah. So this was a booklet that was published by a Jewish organization. And it was supplied for the public in order to alert them to the fact that the Mashiach was coming. Now, they were specifically uh, interested in, in urging uh, Jewish people to be ready, to get ready for his arrival. But upon his arrival, the book began, began to explain that he would bring about a brand new world. And this new world where there would be no illness, there would be no jealousy between individuals, there'd be no more poor, no more hungry, then there would be harmony between people. And Mashiach, the book continued to say, was a very special person. They explained that he was one of a kind. He was wise. He would bring in peace. And he would be the leader of the Jewish people, just like his ancestor, the great King David. You know what's interesting about this is that if I insert Jesus Christ as Mashiach, this booklet could be found in just about any Christian home. While our Christian or our Jewish neighbors are anticipating the arrival of Mashiach, Christians are looking for the return of Mashiach. And that's what 2 Peter 3.10 states emphatically. It begins by saying, the day of the Lord will come. And the day of the Lord is synonymous with the return of Jesus Christ. And Peter is insisting here that 
This is not only a day that is certain, it will happen, but when it arrives, and when he arrives, when Mashiach, you know, returns, this present heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and its works will be disclosed. So you see that the present world in which we occupy, as we see it, will undergo a radical change. And it will be recreated. It will be replaced by what is called a new heaven or new heavens and a, a new earth. And the reason why our Jewish friends will use the same language to describe this is because it is written about in the Old Testament in virtually the same language. Isaiah 65, 16 and 17, For I will create a new heavens and new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. Then we will be glad, rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I will create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. So this is what the Jewish... Um, nation or Jewish people, those who, who follow the scriptures, um, who believe this. And uh, it sounds virtually like the return of Jesus Christ. Now, how this will happen, this replacement, this recreation, it begins by explaining that it's going to happen by fire. Now, fire in the scripture is sometimes used as a metaphor, not always literal, but when it's used as a metaphor, it's used as a symbol of, of purging, of like uh, removing the dross. Uh, uh, and, and so you, you remove the impurities. It can also be used metaphorically as uh, judgment. And there are times in Scripture where fire is used that way. But I think in what Peter is describing is something that's not just metaphorical. It's not just a symbol. But this is actually a descriptive of something literal. Verse 12, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. Now, each summer we see on the news some kind of a forest fire, usually out west, that just begins to devour hundreds and thousands of acres and leaves the landscape just decimated and nothing but ash. And we can see the damage to the extent that, you know, we're horrified at what it can do. I guess a couple of years ago, Australia had um, a tremendous fire that took, you know, thousands and thousands of acres. And so we, we understand something of the damage that a, a fire can do. But what is described here is on a global scale. This is massive change that takes place on planet Earth. And so it describes it this way. First of all, the heavens will disappear with a loud noise. Oh, what does that mean? Well, there's some of it that's a mystery. We're not having a physics lesson here. We are having a description of what will take place. Revelation 6.14 speaks about the sky splitting apart like a scroll being rolled up. It almost sounds, you know, like a thermonuclear thing going on and that heavens is split apart. But whatever the case, the atmosphere goes under such tremendous force and, and, and change that it's as though it is ripped and torn asunder. Now, the second thing that Peter says is that the elements will burn and be dissolved. What are the elements? Remember science class? Remember looking at the periodic table of elements, you know, row after row? I had a lot of that when I was uh, in, in, uh, in college. And, and what we would do, we would look at these basic building blocks of everything that we see, the whole world in which we live. And, and, but so intense will this fire be in engulfing the, the globe and the heavens, that there's something on a molecular level here 
where it, it, the word dissolve could be the word loosen. So it's like an atomic, it's like, you know, loosening. And things begin to melt and tear apart and come apart. And then the third thing in verse 10 says, the works on it that is on the earth will be disclosed. Well, what does it mean by disclosed? It means that they will be exposed for what they really are. And so we have the works of mankind, those things that have been done openly, those things that have been done secretly, but they will be exposed for what they really are and not what people have wanted us to think. Now, people have taken such pride in the works of their hands and the inventions that have come to their mind. And, uh, and many people will spend years building this personal empire. And they give their lives to it. They pour their time, their finances, uh, and some are very good at it. And it can be on a large scale where you get a billionaire who's created really an empire, a financial empire. And then you get, you know, just you know, ordinary people like ourselves. But we could do something maybe similar. Now, I, I think of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, of the, that ancient wonder of the world, of Babylon. And it says of Nebuchadnezzar that he boasted like this, is, not, is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory. The boasting that takes place. Human beings have done this for centuries. This goes back. You can go back to Babylon, remember? As they built this edifice and said, we're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to build it to the heavens. This is the way mankind has been. And in the future... The works of our hands, the idols that we have created, that we worship, that we really, in essence, bow down to, and that we take such glory in, they will be exposed for what they truly are when that great burning takes place. And what will they prove to be in the end? Nothing. Nothing. What people have just given their lives to and yet in our inflated egos, we have refused to give glory to God. And instead, we have worshipped the works of our hands. But it'll all end up as ashes, all just vaporized and disappear. Now, when Jesus Christ returns, the heavens and the earth will literally be burned and undergo such intense heat that nothing of the old life of what we presently see that has been affected, including creation, according to Romans 8, as it groans under this curse. But even creation and all that we see will undergo this, this change. And, um, and it will come as a result of this intense burning on that great day in the future. And on that day, God will recreate and replace and reform this world. Now, how is he going to do that? Well, it doesn't say. I know in the first world, it says he spoke and it was done. How is that going to happen in the, in the world to come or this new world that is described here? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't say. I know when we look about us and we see how the society and governments have tried to fix what was, is broken in our world. They have poured trillions of dollars into what we can do to help ourselves. And so you'll get a, 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 an enterprise that says, you know, if we only educate people, if they will no longer be in ignorance and we can pull them out of that ignorance, then we can help them and the world will be a better place. Well, how's that working for us? And then we go on and we see how people will be told that, you know, it's your environment. It's the circumstances into which you were born. That if we only take you out of that and put you in better circumstances, you will be a different person, a better person. Well, that doesn't prove itself to be true either. And others will look at, well, we need to do something with the climate right now because if we're going to save humanity, 
we need to work on that. And then there are other isms out there, socialism, communism, and we of course get democracy, and those are ways that we can kind of organize and conduct ourselves, and all of these are works of people. And none of it is proved helpful. Even those who, who remove themselves from society and they, they construct what they call utopian colonies. And you have utopian colonies that have been constructed over past centuries. I don't know if there's any around today. But I know that there were. And like in the 1800s, the Amana colony that was out in the Midwest and, uh, and others that have tried. But they're so strict and legalistic and trying to manage people's lives. But that doesn't work either. Why? Because we're flawed. And flawed people are trying to re or create this. It's flawed before it even gets going. Well, the only answer, the only fix that we can have, the only hope that we have is if God steps in and if he purges out the corruption that can be traced back to the fall and he replaces it and he recreates what has been damaged by sin. Now, the only real solution even today for those things that are really fundamentally broken in the heart is that we need a different heart. We need a new heart. We need to be born again. We need to be regenerated. And that's what the Bible talks about when Christ comes in and literally changes us from the inside out. And he is gathering a new humanity to occupy this new world that he's going to, to create. And this new humanity that he is creating right now is the church. It's, it's many of us, I hope all of us, but certainly many of us in this room today. You're part of that new humanity that he's pulled out of the world and said, okay, I'm separating you unto myself for this new world that I'm building. But even those of us here, we know that our hearts are flawed. And so we need to be, you know, we need to be perfected, glorified, the Bible talks about. And that will come in the future. Revelation 21, 27 states, about this new world, nothing unclean will ever enter it. And back in verse 13 of 2 Peter 3, it talks about this new earth where righteousness dwells. What that means here is that the kind of people who will occupy this new world will be those who are sinless and incapable of sinning. And that is the work that God has to do within the, the human heart. So what's been flawed and damaged by the, the fall and what has infected the world and, and humanity around us in this present age is going to remove, be removed when Jesus Christ returns. And Revelation 21 used descriptive language like this about the future. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. God's dwelling place is with humanity and he will live with them. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things, that is what we experience, the previous things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. You know, when I talk about this new world and I'm describing it here in these last minutes, doesn't it sound like fiction? I mean, doesn't it sound something so alien to our experience that we think, could that be true? Well, actually, God himself stands behind this promise. It's not only found in his word, but he's the one who stands behind it. So many times in the Old Testament, even in the book of Isaiah, you'll find a statement where God speaking through the prophet, but he concludes it by saying, the Lord has spoken, period. It's going to happen. And in this case, it's certainly going to happen. Verse 10, as I go back and say that emphatically, 
Peter states, the day of the Lord will come. Now it's important for us to understand that while we look forward to a new heavens and a new earth, that the emphasis that Peter is making here is not about, you know, giving us a science lesson and describing it. It doesn't go into that kind of detail here. His emphasis and why he goes so deeply into this is, is because he wants to help us understand that this is a day of accounting for us. And we need to be prepared for that, to get our lives in order. And that every human being, every human being who has ever lived, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, will have to stand before their Creator and give an account of their life. And that includes Christians. It's very, very important for us as believers to realize that we will give an accounting of how we have lived. And this is how it states it in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad, whether good or evil. So Christians will be judged by how they have lived as Christians, as servants of the Lord. And this is why Peter states in verse 11, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. See, as we get this locked into our minds, and we understand that this isn't just some myth, this isn't a fairy tale, this is reality. All of this that's just described will happen. And when we get that locked and fixed in our minds, it's going to affect how we live now. And we will look at all of the decisions that we're making in light of that. We will order our lives with that in mind. So that it isn't about, well, I'm going to operate by my feelings in what I think I should do here. And what will make me happy. If you live by that formula, you will be ashamed when you stand before Christ. If you profess yourself to be a Christian, if you're a non-Christian, it's an entirely different kind of judgment. But for Christians, this is something that is serious business. And, and we gotta, we've got to live with this in mind. So what are you seeking after in your life? What is it that your, your, your goals are, your priorities? How are you ordering your life? Is it the kind of life and the kind of decisions that you're making where when it says that we will be repaid for what we have done in the body, whether good or evil, how's that going to look for you? If you live by your feelings to please yourself and you live in the moment, well, then you will have to answer to Christ for that. And so we ask the question, well, then what sort of person should I be? Well, Paul or Peter answers that with four imperatives that I'll just drop quickly into your minds. And these four imperatives, now bear in mind, this isn't something out of like Andy Griffith, where we're just going to tell you all be better people. We're talking about something that is serious here. This weighs heavy upon us. This is more than just be a better person. The first thing, the first imperative of how we're to, to live, what sort of people ought we to be, verse 14. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight. So the first thing that we see here is zealously strive to be found unashamed. Unashamed. We are to make every effort. That same carries over from the first chapter where that was mentioned twice. Here it comes up again. Make every effort. You know it has the aroma of holy sweat on it and a fixed determination. If you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord, then your moral life should reflect that. If you claim that you are a Christian, and yet the way you live is opposite to that claim, then you will have to answer to Christ. And, and he says that there will be those who will, when he comes, 
I mean, the implication here is that they will be with spots and they will be blemished. And, uh, and, and that's not a place that, that I want to be. Um, now, what we're describing here is not a list of church rules. We're not describing some kind of life of legalism where a particular church has a code that everybody is told to live by. And it's really about performance and how you look and how you dress and what you listen to. Well, you know, to me, that's like a school play. That's like playing a part. You want to play a part? Anybody can play a part. And you can look the part. But your inner life can be a wreck. So we're not talking about outward appearance. Peter's talking about something deeper. He's talking about godly character. About walking in step with the Holy Spirit. And walking in a manner according to the moral uprightness that we have been called to do. And so it starts with our private life. This is not about a dress code. This is not about some list of church rules. This is something that goes far, far deeper. And it begins with a heart that is for God. 1 John 2.28, Dearer children, remain in fellowship with Christ. Remain in fellowship. I mean, abiding in Him, in a right and proper relationship, daily relationship with Him. Remain in fellowship with Christ so that when He returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from Him in shame. Again, the implication is that there will be those who will shrink back in shame when they see Him. As though like, oh, you know. Uh, so that's the first. Zealously strive to be found unashamed. But secondly, verse 14, the very last phrase says to be at peace. And to me, in, and not just to me, but really what, it, what it's talking about is that as Christians that we zealously strive to, to enter into and live in the peace that we have in Christ. To, to live in it, to enjoy it, to enjoy Jesus. Because when you enjoy Jesus, you're enjoying God. And uh, now we have been made right with God. We've been justified by faith in Christ. So we have peace with God now. But he's talking about living out your life in, um, in a relationship, in an experience of peace, of enjoying that peace, of knowing who Christ is and who he is to you and for you in your relationship with him and to live at peace and abiding in him because he is your mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. And he says, enjoy that. He's, he's for us. He loves us. And he wants to, to, to uh, fellowship with us. This is what Revelation 3.20 is all about when it says, See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with him and he with me. It doesn't get any better than that. And so it's a description of a person who is really at peace and enjoying that peace with God. And we enjoy that peace with God as we get to know Jesus Christ. I mean, he is an amazing person. And to know him better, to sing to him, to meditate, to meditate upon the lengths to which Christ went in order to save you. I mean, consider that one. Consider that one. The lengths to which Christ went to save me. I'm going to think about that. You know, and as we do, we come to love him more. He's our pastor. He's our defender, our friend. We talk things over with him. We get his advice. We spill out our confusion to him and our struggles. He's our friend. It's a relationship with him. We defer to his will. We say, whatever you want me to do in this situation, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put aside my own preferences, and I'll do what you want to do. That's what I'm talking about. See, when you're not doing that, then you're not at peace. Ha, I guarantee you, if you're a Christian, you know, the Holy Spirit isn't working in you. He's working on you. And you're, you're in a miserable state. And you're not enjoying the peace that, that is available. 
So that's the second thing, enjoying the peace. But thirdly, verse 15, what sort of people should we be? Thank God for the patience that, that gives room for repentance. So we're a people that is, are thankful to the Lord for the, for the, that He's given another day for our, our precious loved ones that are so dear to us who are unsaved. He's given them another day, another opportunity to turn in faith to Him, in saving faith. We all have close relatives. Maybe for you it's an uncle, it could be a parent, could be a son or daughter, maybe it's a nephew, but somebody within your circle or a close friend, maybe it's a coworker of yours. You've known each other for years, but you know that if Christ were to come, they would not be caught up to meet him in the air. They wouldn't be in that number. I don't care how nice a person they are, that they wouldn't be in that number because they're not regenerated, they're not born again. And so thank God for his patience. That's why Peter states, also regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. As what? Salvation for those who have not yet believed. Thank God for this. So we pray for our loved ones that they would not squander the long suffering of the Lord. And then finally, fourthly, what sort of people are, should we be while we wait? Well, number four, verses 17 and 18, we need to increase in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and in experiencing his grace. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on your guard so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people and fall from your own stable position, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. The best way to protect ourselves from dangerous error and the stuff that you find out there, either in the bookstores or on the internet, and I'm talking about religious stuff, um, the best way is to, is to focus in upon your knowledge, your personal knowledge of Jesus, and to in, experience his grace. I mean, he lavishly pours that on us every day, even though we may not even realize it. I mean, it's a whole barrel full. He just continues to pour it out because he loves us so much. We may not even realize it, but he is. He is, and we can grow in grace and knowledge, and we delight ourselves in the Lord. And the more we, the more we personally know Jesus, the more we grow to love him, and the more that we see his glory as a foretaste of heaven. Now get this, out of, out of John 17, 24, Jesus said his highest aspiration of us is not that we just show up in heaven. That's not it. He says, I want them to see my glory. I mean, how about that? That's what he wants. He knows, he knows that when that happens, wow, what a day that will be. And he said, you can have a foretaste of that by faith if you get to know me now in this world. And so we get to know him better. And we do so deliberately. How do we do that? Well, we, we get into the Bible and we read about him. For example, for example, one of the, the, probably the greatest miracle that has ever taken place on planet Earth and in the history of the universe, the greatest miracle is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And so if you begin to look at that and study that and, and see that as the implications, it, you don't get anything except excited. And you grow to love him. And you see something of the magnitude, the lengths to which he would go to save you. And you see something of his glory, of what, what makes him as, as great and mighty as he is. Another, I would suggest, would be the fact that Jesus is our mediator. And in and, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, puts them together. There is one God and, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so if you will study and, and begin to explore this, you will come to know Jesus 
You know, and as and I, I said, you know, earlier in the first service, I said, you know, some of us, we know more about our hobby than we know about Jesus. If I would walk in and say, hey, what do you got going on here? I mean, you could go for an hour telling me all of the things about that particular hobby and get me all excited, like, you got to do this. This is great. But if I were to ask you to something about, well, can you tell me something about Jesus being your mediator? It's like crickets. Or, you know, or, or the incarnation. Why is the incarnation so special? Why is that the greatest thing that ever happened on planet Earth? And you say, well, you know, Christmas? Is that it? Christmas? Well, yeah. No, it's, it's far more than that. Far more than that. But, but these are the things that show us Christ's glory. So let me kind of close and wrap it up by saying there is a great day ahead, but we need to get prepared for that day. And we can do so right here and now and never let a day pass without really um, drawing close to Christ. Make it your highest goal in life that from here on out, the thing that you want to know more about than any other subject in all of life is that I want to know more about Jesus. Now, I understand you have business and you have your job and you, have things, and you know a lot about that. Many of you went to graduate school. But from here on out, as far as what occupies the highest goal of your life, would you make it Jesus and get to know him and see something of his glory? And Peter says, if you do that, it's the best life possible. It really is. So, zealously strive to be unashamed. Zealously strive to enjoy the peace that you have with God. Thank him for his patience, allowing your unsaved loved ones to, to come to faith in Christ. And then increase in your personal knowledge of Christ and enjoy more and more of his grace day by day. Let's go before him in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we look unto you now because we realize that much of this is, is uh, we are incapable of getting there in our own power. And this requires your help. And so we appeal to you today. We know it is your will that we know you and that we come to love your son, Jesus Christ, and that we walk in step with the Holy Spirit. That's, this is your desire for us. So help us to that end, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.